Okay, so that's the article there. And I'm just going to read through it, and uh, and we'll run through uh, a couple of uh, couple of comments. Uh, I'll I'll intermittently go through. I did this last week, and I had a really really good time. Oh, one more comment. Texas was that was that state. I think there were some others too. Yeah, I I know there. It was it was like the wildest thing, and and there's like a whole rule where it's like you're you're not supposed to sue the president. <laughs> like. <laughs> I think Nix I think it was like something along with Nixon where they were like there was there would have been so many cases against Nixon they were just like you can't sue the president while he's in duty there's just too many lawsuits uh but uh let's let's look at the mutual aid uh mutual aid piece here uh that's the wrong screen okay so um uh, the article comes from a website called wagingnonviolence.org uh, I read through this, this piece today and I wanted to read it through with you guys and then we'll kind of stop and, uh, I'll give you guys like my thoughts on what we just read. And then, uh, if this thing starts running a little bit long, um, I'll stop and look at your comments in, in between cause, it, cause it breaks it up into a couple different sections. So I'll have time to kind of look at your comments and, and respond to them, uh, in the interim of reading the article itself. So it'll kind of break things up a little bit. Uh, so the title is Amid the Coronavirus Crisis, Mutual Aid Networks Erupt Across the Country. Uh, and this is from the end of March. Uh, this is how long shit's been. Th this, I mean, th things have been going on well before this. Um, you know, there there have been mutual aids uh, in practice for, for quite some time. But especially now, like things have kind of ramped up. They've gone to the next level. Uh, so this is from the end of March. And, you know, this is an idea that I, I don't particularly see uh, a lot of highlight on. So. Let us read. Uh, as the first coronavirus cases came to Washington state, the government response was both slow and confused. That's when the community members knew they were going to have to build something themselves if they wanted to get through this pandemic. If we recognized that uh, we couldn't rely on the current systems in place and, and needed to take care of each other directly, said Janelle Walter of the Tacoma Mutual Aid Collective, an all-volunteer organization of community members sharing resources. Mutual aid means creating a network that can be mobilized immediately without needing permission. Eleanor Goldfield, who we just talked about, uh, has been helping out with the DC mutual aid and uh, has been one of the few voices that have addressed uh, mutual aids. Uh, set right near Puget Sound, Tacoma is a working class city uh, down the road from Seattle that does not have a large left wing political scene like other West Coast metrop metropolises. I think that's how you pronounce that. Uh, they were hit with the first wave of what would become a nationwide and global pandemic, shutting down social services, forcing people out of their jobs and leaving entire communities struggling to hold on. This was a crisis of catastrophic proportions that no one was prepared to deal with. And it came on like an avalanche over a couple of days. Tacoma Mutual Aid Collective formed quickly and from people who wanted to create a strong system for supporting the most affected and immediately started doing grocery and prescription pickups and deliveries for people who could not risk going out into public. They began a Saturday grocery and school uh, supply distribution in front of the local McCarver Elementary School where families could drive up, grab what, grab what they needed, and head out without violating, a new, uh, without violating the new rules of social distancing. The goal was to listen to those they shared the 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 neighbors with or sorry i'm going to reread that sentence the goal was to listen to those they shared the uh, the neighbors with to hear what people needed and to start a system of sharing uh i'm pretty sure this is what my buddy uh pierre vachon does uh shout out to pierre vachon very funny comedian uh and entertainer he does this thing called the quarantine show almost every single night um but I'm pretty sure this is how Pierre spends his days. He creates stuff for people. Like he's sending me masks for, for me and my mom. He delivers groceries and prescriptions to people in their community. Like he, and he's not part of like DoorDash or whatever. He'll just go and, and pick up stuff for, for people. So um, it's kind of like, like he's like a one man mutual aid machine, which is pretty fucking cool. 
Uh, mutual aid is community, Walter explained, relying on each other's Relying on each other builds trust and capacity. It re removes the need for paternalistic approaches uh, to aid uh, like we see with nonprofits and other state programs. We are seeing mutual aid projects pop over all over, several here in Tacoma, and it's because folks are realizing that our systems collapse in emergency situation, whether it be a pandemic or a natural disaster. Systems that are already inefficient and officials who are already incompetent, uh, are unable to meet basic human needs. So we take care of each other. Excuse me. Um, yeah, I mean, the reason why they fail is in, in, a, in a pandemic or a disaster situation, like profit motives have to be set aside. Um, you, you, you are going to see a loss of profit as a, as a corporation. But in, in, to, to me, it's one of those things where it's like, well, yeah, no shit, because people need help. Like at this point, like you don't need to make money, you know, like there, there have been dozens of times, well, over dozens of times in my career where I've just like foregone a paycheck for a gig uh, on a Friday or Saturday night, which are like essentially big money nights to help out a charity, to help out uh, a, a, you know, a, a community driven, whatever, to, to raise some funds, to help a library, to help a cancer support group. Like, yeah, you just do that sort of stuff. Like when people are going through a tough time, like sometimes you just don't need to make money. And it's part of the reason why when I'm doing these virtual shows, I'm like, Hey, if you are struggling, hit me up. I will gladly give you a free ticket because you know, for, as how cheesy it sounds is like we are in this together like everybody is going through a really tough time and if you need you know an hour to just laugh at how absurd this political system is then yeah i got your back you know like come come hang out with some cool people and uh and 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 be a part of a little virtual community it's it'll be pretty rad so this section is called uh the community of helping the united states the world's largest economy has been driven to practical halt as every single state is dealing with outbreaks of a deadly coronavirus called COVID-19. That's pretty not exactly accurate. The virus is called SARS-CoV-2. The disease is called COVID-19, whatever. The WHO fucked up that. That's that's the WHO, the way they released that information was kind of fucked up. Anyway, that's an aside. That's just an aside. It's a little minor thing of just like, but it's not, it's not 100% accurate. <laughs> As the global death toll rises to tens of thousands and people are reminded of earlier flu pandemics that knocked percentage points uh, off the world's population, governments have scrambled to figure out what the best course of action could be. The bureaucracy has left many communities behind, particularly as shelter orders come down and businesses close, leaving many people without income to support their families. This is one of the worst case scenarios for a public health threat and most communities have been left to fend for themselves. A lot of the communities we talked about in our prior segment, right? The, the undocumented community, uh, people that are living in abusive situations are kind of, you know, in, in a precarious situation, well, in, in a much more precarious situation. Um, you have sex workers that are ineligible to get, uh, you know, get any sort of aid because of because of morality uh so you know who helps them out is is things like mutual aids they can turn to mutual aids and say hey i need i i, I don't have food this week and they'll deliver you a bunch of food that that you can that you can utilize to feed your families because as we saw uh people that are in sex work a lot of them are um single moms so you know they have kids that that need to be taken care of Okay, we'll keep reading. The clarity of this situation has led people active in their community, some political and some simply looking for the best tools for survival, to start developing a series of mutual aid groups to help each other uh, meet their basic needs. Mutual aid is the idea that humans should help humans, even and especially outside any market forces, said uh, Brett O'Shea of the Nebraska Left Coalition, who also hosts the podcast Re Revolutionary Left Radio. Human cooperation, solidarity, and communalism is built deep into our DNA, and mutual aid is just what the aspect of humanity looks like in practice. I agree with that statement. 
I think this is sort of just this this mutual aid to me is uh, it's all volunteer run and it's all donation based. So whatever whatever folks can donate in terms of like um, supplies, food, things of that sort, or money in general. Um, yeah, that's kind of what they live on. They live on donations. Like no one's making money off of this. This is truly just altruism and humans helping humans because humans need help. Um, you know, um, how many more times can I say help and humans in one sentence? Uh, uh, we will not go down that rabbit hole. Uh, but yeah, I think this is, this is sort of like one of the truest forms of altruism and compassion. And all those things have become like acts of a revolution. When you when you throw profit aside uh, to a system that's purely driven on profit and and worships the market like it's a religion, uh, yeah, this is this is as revolutionary as it fucking gets. <clears throat> so let us keep reading. Mutual aid is the idea that when we support each other, when we support each other's needs in a reciprocal relationship, but without the obligation uh, or exchange we have the best chance to survive and flourish. Mutual aids projects have been a staple of radical social movements for decades, from food distribution services like Food Not Bombs to survival pending revolution programs of the Black Panthers, which included free clinics and free breakfast programs. Uh, when the state fails to meet the needs of the public, many communities will build resources themselves, and in doing so, will build an alternative to hierarchical bureaucracies in the government. And that is why this is so dangerous, by the way, is because it makes you less dependent on, um, on, on these bureaucracies. And regarding the Black Panthers, I'm working on a much larger piece about this right now. Uh, but I, I want a big chunk of it to be about these survival projects, uh, these, these survival, um, the, the survival pending revolution uh, of, of the Black Panther Party that was started by Bobby Seale. That was Bobby Seale's sort of um, organizing methodology. That's when J. Edgar Hoover, another paranoid man, um, targeted them and decided to use COINTELPRO to destabilize uh, this thing because because the especially the free breakfast program for kids went, for lack of better. Uh, it went viral. I'm sorry. I'm, I had to say it, but, but like it kind of spread very quickly. They were teaching people in various different cities how to make something like this happen. And that's when J. Edgar Hoover, who was scared of a black messiah, um, was, used COINTELPRO to infiltrate the, the Panthers and try to break them up from the inside out, which it, to, to some respects, he, he did succeed in doing that. But I mean, the, he, he was a paranoid man thinking that there was going to be a black messiah that was going to come down and create like a race war and take the white man out of out of power. I don't, I don't really know. It was, it, it, it's, it's mildly confusing and also kind of white supremacist at the same time. <laughs> but that's why it's so dangerous, though. It subverts bureaucracy. It subverts us needing to depend on a broken system that is not intent on, that's not really intent on um, uh, sharing anything with us. It's not really intent on um, helping each other out. It's it's very much intent on keeping its position of power uh, intact and in place without us just depending on each other. And, the, and mutual aid kind of subverts all that shit. Uh, because this is this is literally getting food to people's mouths as directly as you possibly can, right? Where we had like Nancy Pelosi in the very beginning of all this on like March 16th, uh, Steve Mnuchin and Trump were like, maybe we should give direct checks every single month during this crisis to American citizens. And Nancy Pelosi was like, "Bah, but no, but we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't. We should make them, you know, basically go and run around and create these." tax incentive things like and it was just like how is this helping people oh, well, the, uh, I, I think i missed this illustration uh that's a pretty adorable illustration solidarity not charity yeah aid activism education uh this is very cool okay mutual aid is a reciprocal respectful relationship and it is distinct 
from charity or government programs, says Devin Sertas of the Triangle Mutual Aid in Piedmont, North Carolina. Uh, mutual aid avoids the bureaucratic inefficiencies we often see in governments and large non-governmental organization and instead hopes to build community. Uh, every event that stresses our systems, uh, every event that stresses our system forces us to choose. Will we hoard toilet paper and sanitizer, bolt the door and embrace the National Guard curfews? Mutual aid chooses instead to plant gardens, pool our resources, prioritize those most in need and protect those uh, most vulnerable. Gee, kind of like how a government system is supposed to fucking operate. <laughs> In almost every city around the United States, mutual aid networks have started for, uh, started to form, ranging from uh, projects for resource distribution to simple options like fundraising, compiling lists of resources and contacts, and creating chat threads so people in the same area can stay in contact with the, one another. The speed with which these groups have arrived and the depth of care many of them offer have started to show what options communities have when the large institutions fail and are unwilling to deal with disaster. Now, this is incredible because this is like using technology in a positive way. And there's a lot of people, like I'm friends with a bunch of people that are like terrified of technology and with good reason, because, you know, they use it to like spy on people and, uh, and uh, for intelligence agency networks and stuff. This is a way that you can use technology to create a positive change um, in a society. Because, I mean, using these sort of like chat threads and compiling resources and text chains and, you know, uh, encrypted messaging and things of that sort, like they've essentially built a movement in every single city under the core idea of compassion, altruism, and helping your fellow man. Uh, that's amazing. Meanwhile, most of, I'm pretty sure I'm getting this correctly, but most of like social security is, is run on like floppy disk technology. <laughs> yeah. I remember what floppy disks are. I don't know if, 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 if there are youngsters watching that know what, what floppy disks are, if I can, if I can hike my old man pants up a little bit, just you, you youngsters don't know what that floppy disk was all about. Let me tell you about the floppies. <laughs> yeah. And then like, whatever you, whatever people like complain and they're like, Hey, why don't you uh, improve the technology uh, of these social services are like, but the money and the things, and what do we do with, and then there's the Snapchats. Is that involved? Should we involve the snap and the chats? And they're just like, can you just make like a website that works? Is that possible? Can you get it off of like angel fire and go to like, I don't know, like a WordPress thing. Can you just, can you, can you like, can you listen to like a fucking Mark Marin podcast and get a Squarespace code and fucking use that to, to, to create a better website. Like to, just, just something, just fucking something. And they're like, well, I got to eject the floppy disk and maybe get a new, I don't know. Are they still making floppies? Like also, um, and something else to, to, to take into, into account with the history of the black Panthers is, um, uh, I think almost like a decade after the survival programs were put into place, uh, with the free breakfast and everything, like that notion under the Nixon administration was approved. The government was almost a decade behind a radical socialist, like underground mutual aid network that, that are deemed to be terrorists, by the way. <laughs> Their true legacy is creating like a, an effective mutual aid network and they're deemed as terrorists because J. Edgar Hoover was scared of a black messiah and Nixon was paranoid about some other shit. But a decade later, he created uh, like the Breakfast in School program. Uh, that came from the Black Panther Free Breakfast program that started a decade earlier. But, you know, that's not, that's not really taught about the Black Panthers. That's not what the Black Panthers are associated with. I'm going to take a look at the comments real quick. We got one comment. Oh, I'm going to switch over to the screen. Uh, my kids are starting. Uh, my kids are currently watching Wonder, and my first grader came in and asked me what flop. 
<laughs> uh, it must have been in a movie. I'm not surprised they still use them in the government. It, yeah, it's the craziest thing because I remember reading the story and just being like, what is happening? <laughs> like, like there's, there's no way that that's, that can be real. <laughs> like, it's so wild. I remember having them too. I remember it one, I think like the very first laptop we ever had. Uh, <laughs> And floppy disks, like it's it's too it's it's like farcical at this point. <laughs> All right, let's let's get back into the article. Uh, getting what we need. The COVID nineteen crisis is unlike many others because it affects everyone, shuts down businesses and government in a massive sweep, and prevents us from coming together because of the risk of cross infection. This has created an urgent need for uh, resources uh, that is massive in scope, including everything from medical supplies to food and childcare. This is why many of the groups that first formed focus on centralizing all their resource, all the resources that were available, letting people know how to get a hold of each other and any services uh, that are at their disposal. You know what else? This this notion of getting like they connect certain people, like if. Um, like if you're living in an apartment building and apartment 2B has two people working from home, each making $60,000, they're doing okay. But apartment e, 3E has both people that lost their income or a majority of their income and are struggling to get by and they don't know what they're going to do to feed their kids. Well, they go, hey, have you met people in 2B? Because they're doing okay. Maybe they can help you guys out. And they connect them. Uh, there is a church run by a gentleman named Mike Mather in Indianapolis. My friend Stuart Huff told me about this. And this concept has constantly been ringing in the back of my head for like three years. Um, Stuart told me that he has some, uh, uh, Mike Mather has somebody in his church called a professional listener. And he just goes around the neighborhood and he listens to people and he takes in their stories. And if there's something that he hears, where two people can help each other out, he connects those two people. That's his whole fucking job. And that to me is like, what a necessary job that we need right now. Like what a what an amazing job to have, especially in the face of a crisis, right? And I, and I know I've mentioned this before is if something works in the moment of a crisis, there's a very good likelihood that it's gonna work in, in regular non-crisis circumstances. So like this definitely works in a non-crisis circumstance. Um, so whenever they, whenever they talk about like connecting people and stuff, it just, it automatically reminds me of the professional listener and how incredible of a fucking idea that is. Um, Stuart Huff, by the way, comedian, everybody should, uh, check out cause he's amazing. Um, so, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. oh, this project is serving as a hub or clearinghouse of information as opposed to other organizations which are directly providing aid. We do not have the people, time, or money to directly provide assistance, but we can help you find the resources that they need, uh, said Andy, Ru Andy Ruto of the NYC United Against Coronavirus, which came together on March 12th to create a master resource document. Uh, I believe we have already past the point where our governments at the city, state, and national level can adequately meet the needs of society under this ongoing coronavirus pandemic. That means that, that we will need to take care of each other and we will need to keep each other safe. Honestly, like, I, I have only survived to the base point of what I've survived through is through the generosity of People that donated became patrons, fucking bought albums and, and bought tickets to, to the virtual shows. It has nothing to do with the government. Like the government has done dick all for me. Like I'm one of those people that can't really get the gig, gig worker unemployment. Can't really, I don't, I don't want to get this, uh, even try to get the small business loans because it's not for me. Um, and I, and I'm, pr you know, probably wasn't eligible for the 1200 bucks. And if I was, it went to my ex anyway. So it's like, I, I've essentially kind of seen the generosity of people and why things like mutual aids actually fucking work. Like I have seen that happen. So it's very cool. Like this, and it, that's exactly what he's saying. It, you know, it's just like people coming together, people learn about what people need and, and coming through for each other. Um, so 
Yeah, uh, COVID-19 can affect some people with underlying health conditions uniquely hard. So it's up to many people in the mutual aid organization to volunteer to do errands for them, such as picking up and delivering groceries. Uh, many of the organizations have created a system where volunteers can sign up to do specific duties or shift shifts, um, and uh, then they can connect the people in need uh with the people offering the aid. So again, that kind of goes back to that concept of the professional listener. Every day we are getting endless amounts of volunteers, said Kevin Van Meter, who is working with the Benton County Family Response Team in Corvallis, or Oregon. All these are kind of smaller towns too, by the way. Um, this mutual aid organization was started by the Coalition of graduate employees, a graduate student union at the Oregon State University, which has been doing mutual aid uh, before the crisis to help support the struggling student workers. Now they have uh, 150 volunteers ready to do runs, more than, more than the requests are coming in. Uh, that's probably changing now for the fact that this stuff is starting to shut down. People are having to stay at home, uh, people are having a stay at home order. The crisis is deepening um, in their own lives and now they have to lean on these services like never before, Ben Meter added. The Mutual Aid Network of a Ypsilanti, or many, oh, that's really cool, um, in Michigan predated the crisis and was created uh, by people involved in other organizations, including the coalitions of Emulkily Workers, Mutual Aid Disaster Relief, and the Industrial Workers of the World. Uh, many, which actually has a 5013C or C3 C3 status was able to respond quickly to the pandemic because they had already been doing the work of building community connections in advance of uh, doing support work for local food pantries and providing meals. Ypsilanti has faced tough economic circumstances and uh, that many cities in the Rust Belt have with 30% poverty rate and 13% of the students being homeless. Oof. Uh, before the coronavirus hit, the community was still grasping for resources that were not available uh, through government programs. Because we've spent the last year building inten intentionally, we plan on responding to the pandemic with the same slow moving progress uh, we've used to build this project out, said Peyton McDonald, an organizer with many. We are committed to a solidarity, not charity approach to organizing and won't claim to be expert on mutual aid since we believe that it is uh, an inherent part of life. It's important to stress that we don't give mutual aids to less fortunate. Our existing programs are still taking off and this is a global crisis. Uh, this, and this global crisis is testing their limits. Yeah, so that's an interesting statement that they don't they don't particularly help um, the the less fortunate, uh, you know. So that's kind of a that's kind of an interesting statement to make. I think they just help people that need to be helped. Health resources are particularly scarce, including basic sanitation tools such as cleaning supplies, hand sanitizer, uh, which were sold out in many places within days of the pandemic starting, which was crazy to me. Like I. Uh, that, that still is wild that like the second we say the word pandemic, everybody's like, we got to get all the toilet paper. It was just like, you don't think every, other people need it? Maybe you just need like two. Just get two and fucking leave. In Portland, groups organized in a coalition, including the Democratic Socialists of America, Symbiosis, Pop Mob, and Portland Action Medics have begun <clears throat> a network that delivers resources and creates materials from scratch, including making their own hand sanitizer and World Health Organization recipe. <clears throat> By the way, I think my buddy Pierre in uh, in Middlebury, Vermont, does this for people in his city. Great guy, that Pierre Bashan. Good guy. <clears throat> A really simple thing you can do is contribute to any efforts to get food or sanitation supplies out into the community. We need to we need to slow the spread which means making it easier for people to avoid close proximity and keep their hands clean, said uh, ILA, the, a street medic who was helping to put on a resource fair to hand out important tools before the shelter at home orders were put into place. Each of our actions affects others. We are all 
on this planet together. We are all in this pandemic together and we need to start acting like it. The more we take care of each other, the better off we will all be. I think that's a very fair statement. I, although, you know, a lot of people don't kind of see it that way. I feel like that's sort of the misguided shift of um, like the lockdown protesters that, you know, that were all kind of like faced with trying to understand this concept and just couldn't fathom it. Um, and then we're just like, I got to get the haircuts. What if I become a hippie? Like, and then it's just like, yeah, maybe, maybe you should become a hippie. Uh, seems like it'll be pretty cool. Volunteers from the network are distributing supplies, including hand sanitizers and working to create dependable drop-off locations that people will know and visit. This honestly, like at this point, mutual aid networks have like 200 times more organization skills than the federal government does. <laughs> <laughs> like, like Nancy Pelosi is like, we got to do like means testing to see if, if this compassion thing is going to work. Like what if, but I gotta, I gotta compare my stacks of money to my stacks of ice cream to my stacks of compassion. And then I just knock the compassion away. So it's like, we can't even mean test because I keep kicking the compassion. <laughs> and, and here we are just like people just organized, getting together and fucking getting shit done. You know, <laughs> As 3.3 million people are laid off because of the of coronavirus closures, they need the need for money is going to become as pressing as food and medicine. That is why several of the mutual aid organizations have simply prioritized fundraising efforts to get money where it's most needed. The Baltimore Mutual Aid and Emergency Relief Fund was created by members of the Food, Clothing, and uh, Resistance Collective Maroon Movement, which formed in 2015 to do ongoing mutual aid work like food distributors, uh, garden support projects and group meals. We are part of the community as opposed to some outside entity doing charity work or bougie handouts, explained member Seema Lee, who was inspired to get involved because of the basic need resources that many marginalized communities have, particularly communities with indigenous people of color. We are looking for we are looking out for our people. We are fiercely anti-capitalist. So we, our work emphasizes doing things in a cooperative manner without money always being involved. Cool. They have also been working with Baltimore Safe Haven to support sex workers during this crisis who have had the added difficulty of finding shelters and being without income. We talked about this earlier in the segment. Our examples and my personal mentors were the Black Panther Party and their survival programs that would help take uh, take care of the needs of the, the, the take care of the needs the state would neglect, while also providing political education in the process. We are about horizontal power for the people. We don't just show up at a disaster for a photo op. Uh, we are always here. Uh, by the way, I, that kind of reminded me is, did you, I don't know if you guys saw this or not, but it's like an insane video of Mike Pence uh, picking up like an empty box for the cameras and he was like mic'd and he set it into the mic. <laughs> and the video got released. And he was like, and they're like, hey, the box is empty. And he's like, what if I just picked up this empty box and it looked good for the cameras? And they were like, sure, fine. I guess that's a thing you could do. Fine, sure. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's so crazy anyway as these projects sprout up or build on the work uh, they have already been doing people are building new methods of coordinating between them and are trying to construct relationships to allow these groups to be dependable beyond the next few weeks Adam Greenberg created the COVID-19 mutual aid coordinate coordination slack channel an instant message service uh, popular in the tech world to start building those bridges between groups so people would have a central place to share resources. My hope is that with the uh, with this Slack, organizers can make their needs known and people can swarm uh, towards what makes sense for them. This could look like uh, more modular distribution templates for direct needs uh, based needs-based aid or consolidation around a set of progressive demands to keep our community safe. Uh, 
The difficulty will be in responding to circumstances that are changing quickly, particularly when the response from the public officials and law enforcement changes daily. All right, I'm going to look at some comments. Additional comment. Uh, during the Great Depression, Henry Ford had a company policy that only one spouse could be employed at Ford Motor. His stated goal was to get as many families with at least one parent employed. That's interesting. I, I know Henry Ford was, uh, as is with all these people, is like they, they do a couple things right and then they do a couple things wrong. That's interesting. I don't think I knew that about Henry Ford. That's a cool, that's, a, that's an interesting fact. Um, yeah, that's cool. Oh, before, got to get it back to that right screen. A radical imagination. While the practical utility of these mutual aid groups is what has received attention and inspired participation, the motivation runs a lot deeper for many of the organizers involved. As income inequality increases and periods of climate and economic crisis expand, uh, many are feeling pulled to build a strong community that can remain vibrant uh, as much as it centers the bonds of solidarity. In a world where preparing for disaster or prepping has a lot of consumer cash, uh, those who practice mutual aid believe that it is actually the relationships and com commitment of support, uh, support people rely rely on that is most critical to our survival. Yeah, I feel like prepping is a very like individu in individualistic thing. Um, where it's just like, I gotta get all the beans. Gotta get all the beans for the future because the future is gonna depend on beans. That's gonna be our currency in the future. It's like, I don't, I don't know if it is. Okay, quote. Cool. Um, this can serve as a model for others because we hope to provide an impetus to overcome the cultural inertia associated with individualism, explained the prison support and anti-fascist group Nashville Anarchist Black Cross. That's kind of a badass name. Um, in a recent interview, if anything positive can be gleaned from the COVID-19 outbreak, it's that our bodies are extremely connected and we should be more mindful of the numerous ways we can we can and do love collectively. Uh, that is empowering us to recognize that we are only as strong as the most vulnerable in our community. Therefore, we all need to take part in actions to protect the community as a whole. They've used their resources to create hygiene packs, hand sanitizer, and other tools to hand out to anyone who needs them with the understanding that fighting a pandemic requires everyone's participation and that everyone needs support. The coming weeks are going to be difficult, yet actual Results will depend on how many people on, on the ground respond. For radical activists at the center of many of these projects, there, there is a desire to simply apply the principles that have been learned from social movements to do their best to support their communities in crisis. In doing so, they can open the door to, to the world they want to build, one that puts value on each member of the community and finds its strength and resilience in uh, collaboration. Again, that is what's so threatening about things like mutual aids to uh, to these larger systems at play um, is is that we'll no longer depend on them. We'll just depend on each other. We'll we'll depend on you know smaller communities building these networks amongst each other, um, and that's very scary to to especially to like the intelligence community. It seems, and then they use the disruption from the intelligence community as like proof of how it doesn't work. Like if you just let this thing grow and build a little bit more and more and more, you'll see like why it's beneficial and why it works. But the intelligence community, like Jay and her, Jay or Hoover coming in and using COINTELPRO um, to try to like break these groups apart is is what creates the failure in the first place. Like the Black Panthers wouldn't, I'll rephrase this, the Black Panther survival programs wouldn't have failed had the FBI just left it alone, but they didn't. And it was like scary for the FBI. They were like, they're, they're fucking feeding people and they're, and they're taking care of the sick people and they're, and they're getting hospital rides for them and shit. This is crazy. They're, they're going to destroy America like this. Ugh. 
mutual aid shows you that there is more than enough to go around and that we all have more in common than the elites and the bosses who would have you believe it's much easier to organize around other issues when that rapport is built, said Seema Lee, who emphasized that long-term effects of the coronavirus are going to be felt for months, maybe years. Uh, I fully expect to see rent strikes and uh, more after so many neighbors have connected uh, over the disaster of mutual aid during the COVID-19. Um, the crisis is bigger than the virus. The crisis is 400 years of white supremacist capitalism and uh, all the contradictions are falling apart before our eyes. We have to start now deciding what things will look like long after this is over. And, and that's true. We have to think about like what the next step is going to be, right? We, we can't really reopen the states without uh, proper testing, proper treatment treatment plans for what happens when people come into play, how are, how are, how are we gonna handle this medically and economically? Um, and those plans exist and they're out there and they are currently being declined by both political parties uh, that are at play. You know, you, you have one candidate that's kind of doing a weird fucked up version of Medicare for all. And then another candidate who is the Democrat that literally said that he'd veto the bill if it ever came down to it. If it ever came down to it, Congress agrees that we need to pass Medicare for all. That's the only way we can get through it. He straight up said he'd veto it because he quote, trust what the pharmaceutical industry wants to do. It's like, you can't move forward without having a plan to, to identify what the problems were in all of these little sectors and then come up with a solution for them. Like, you're just like, yeah, but there wasn't a problem. And it was like, no, but there is. And it's like, yeah, but not if I do this. What if I do this? If I do this, there's no problem, <laughs> right? Like, it's kind of insane the way that they do this. <laughs> so, uh, all right, the impact of mutual aid efforts can do far more than meet immediate health needs. They can build the kind of government bonds uh, that all mass movements emerge from. The willingness to stand in solidarity and struggle as a community. Uh, as, as weeks turn into months, we potentially enter a new era of recession, job losses, and evictions. Those relationships have been f uh, formed doing mutual aid. So mutual aid can also be used <laughs> to push for a deeper, more systemic change that is so desperately needed. End of article. And, and it's true. I, I do think that we are going to be in a uh, state of collective, I don't know. Um, it's like collective trauma. Like we're all kind of in this fucked up situation together. So we will come out of this, like I think with a, with a lot more understanding of solidarity. In my opinion, I think that's that's probably what's um, what's likely to come um, is all of us are going to come out and and realize that we all kind of need to depend on each other like you know and, and this is one of the things like I have a I have a friend of mine uh, Lee camp who who I uh, you know help with this website and social media and stuff so he will he will you know pay me to do that sort of thing and I basically was like hey I'm kind of doing less work on that department. Um, so why don't you just give what you would normally pay me directly to the DC mutual aid? Uh, because I'm kind of doing okay in terms of the fact that like, I don't really have uh, rent to worry about or, f or overwhelming amounts of food to worry about. And I've got a, you know, a little bit of financial stability. Um, but I know there's other people that don't. And that's kind of the way we have to take care of each other. And this is my way of kind of paying it forward is there have been a lot of people that have been incredibly kind and generous to me and uh, especially like in these trying times. And I want to give back a little bit. And so that was, that was kind of my contribution. Um, so, you know, if you, if you know there, there's a mutual aid somewhere in your, in your, uh, in your neighborhood, uh, help them out, you know, a volunteer to be somebody that you, that can be connected uh, for somebody that needs some aid, if you have the ability to donate to them, donate to them. Uh, if you got some extra food, 40% uh, of food goes to waste, uh, globally speaking. And a lot of that, and, and I think 40% of what goes to waste comes from the distribution network. Like it gets uh, ruined in transport um, or it doesn't look pretty enough. Um, so, you know, if you have a little bit, if you have a little bit more, um, help somebody out. 
let's look at your comments. Uh, can you do a whole show in your government voice doing a complete <laughs> parody of our state and federal government's public stances on statements? <laughs> Yes, I'm gonna have to go back and listen to what that government voice is so I can like I can do it on command because I think I just tap into it. <laughs> but I will I, I I will I will try to do that. <laughs> that does sound fun. Uh trust yeah, trust the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, Joe Biden literally said that he would decline Medicare for all because one, look at Italy is what he said, which I don't think is an accurate viewpoint, although I have to do more research on that end of what happened with Italy's healthcare system, but he did literally come out with just like the the pharmaceutical industry knows what it's doing and we should just trust them. <laughs> it was just like, dude, you are losing it way, way more than what people anticipate. <laughs> uh, in the last comment, America in general is very apathetic. Uh, not sure how much radical change the masses will push for. Yeah, you know, I have been thinking about that a whole lot. Um, I've had uh, a lot of conversations that sometimes turn very angry in regards to someone like Joe Biden, who, like, I I don't like him. And, I'm, and like, my decision is, like, Trump's not my candidate, Biden's not my candidate. So I'm kind of in, like, I don't know what I'm going to do when November rolls around. Like I have the green party and, and, and the libertarians. And I guess I'll, I'll try to see if any of those candidates, um, you know, kind of match what I believe in, but a lot of like very intelligent people will just not do something different. Like when I ask, when I ask these very intelligent people, like, Hey, will you vote for a third party? Because Joe Biden doesn't match with, any of the policies or any of the things that you believe in, they kind of circumvent back to that lesser of two evils, most important election. And like the same thing over and over again, it's just like, well, wait a minute, weren't you a Bernie supporter that believed in like radical change and making all the difference and like the revolution and all this other shit. And, but they, but yeah, you're right. It's just, there is, there is apathy when there is somebody that I think, um, everybody can funnel their their fervor into. We're all gung-ho about it. But the second that person kind of disappears, then we're all just like, well, we'll just do what status quo has always told us to do. Uh, which, you know, if you look at the pattern of things, like it just fucking doesn't work. <laughs> it it kind of sucks. Like status quo kind of sucks. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's very interesting. Like I I, I want people to be less apathetic and all of these other government systems that we that that i've looked into or any sort of like community effort um or social radical gov government structures that i've looked at is like yeah they make you more involved in the political process and more involved in like what pieces of legislation and what policies are actually going to do and how they affect uh people's lives um and i think that's uh uh, that I think that's very important. Not just the U.S. Yeah, I I think I think there like what's the, neoliberalism is a is a global is a global phenomenon. Um, I you know so and and I do hear it from everywhere. Is I'm part of like different countries free thinker groups, um, and I got into a thing the other day that I'll probably end up writing about is. And it was basically that, like they were using DNC talking points, right? Like MSNBC talking points. And I don't think these people are dumb. Like I think they're very intelligent people. And I legitimately think that they are, they do believe that what they're doing is the right thing uh, for people, like for humanity. And which, which is, you know, it's unfortunately not, but I think part of that is like, yeah, they, they, part of it is they're set in their apathetic ways. Uh, Tough vote this time. Vote for Biden uh, is the hope. Sits, uh, get Trump out or, or vote third party that will lose and assuredly leave Trump in office in hopes uh, that it causes a stir even within the Dems. Yeah, that's kind of the hope. I think you're right. Um, you know, I think if enough of the if if enough of the lefty votes go to a third party like the Green Party. Um, and even then, like, I know there's a bunch of people that voted for Trump that are just super fucking pissed at everything that he's doing. Uh, if they vote for a libertarian candidate 
and we see like, you know, you know, 30% for the libertarians, 30% for the greens, and then less and less for like, what, what's going to happen if that, if that's the case, you know, like what, what's going to happen if a large number of people start voting third party, like it's going to scare the shit out of the DNC. It's going to scare the shit out of the Republican party. Like, and, and that is kind of the hope is every single time that I've seen the, or the spoiler argument, right? To me, it's not a spoiler argument. To me, it's a wake up call that, that both of these parties should be looking at. Um, and it's, and it's, it's very frustrating to be like, no, look, look at the fact that there is a large number of people who are not, oh, who, who the democratic party is not owed their votes. <laughs> They're not owed your votes. Uh, you should, you should look at that and be like, we have displaced all of these people. Um, and I have to think like how many people that wanted to vote for the green party, but like you said, the third parties are likely to lose and they are likely to lose right now. Um, but if you can put a, if I, I did a whole thing about why, why third parties need to be in a presidential election to get federal funding. It's one of the weird loopholes that they have in, in the rules. Um, that's why though, but if you get them federal funding, they become a legitimate candidate. So they're, they're trying to create a narrative that blocks that legitimacy to the, to the political party. Uh, and keeps that duopoly in place. I mean, they're, but they're, the DNC and the RNC are both corporations that run the election, and they both have like lobbyists that sit in their <laughs> that sit on their boards, like corporate lobbyists that sit on their boards. Like it's crazy. So, uh, but they don't they don't want the Green Party or the Libertarian Party to have any sort of legitimacy. So they will do anything they can, even just to block that five percent to get them federal funding. Uh, that will give the Green Party and uh, the DNC a lot more legitimacy um, and a lot more strength. So, Uli, I'm in the same situation, uh, talking a lot back and forth with Europe and get disappointed a lot. Yeah, I think, but, you know, I've been thinking about what to do about these these frustrations. And honestly, like reading about these mutual aids does give me a lot of hope because I have believed in uh, grassroots uh, ground floor uh movements i think can really start driving some change and i hope that i hope that i'm wrong about people's apathy i hope that people you know will take a look at some mutual aid groups uh, i've been trying to find one in pittsburgh where i live that i can you know maybe uh, find out if i can be of any service to them or or, or what have you like uh you know, like how much of my energy I can donate to them. I would love to, or, or even just highlight the fact that they exist. Um, I've been doing that a, a little bit here and there, you know, and it's, and it is, it is frustrating um, to have to deal with these very intelligent people that are going to go against everything that they believe in, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, this is going to be the last comment and then I'm going to wind down the, the live video. Um, only depends on how many Republicans don't vote the party line compared to the last election. I think the Dems are very nervous about that, even more than Republicans. Yes, that is one thing I will say about the Republicans is that they vote straight down that party line pretty through and through. Like for for somebody for for a political party that fucking hates socialists as much as the Republicans do, boy do they believe in solidarity, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but they do like they, they do they go down the party line i know a bunch of republicans that i've met because here's the thing it's like republicans come to my shows it's kind of crazy and they show up and they listen and then they come up and and they say they didn't agree with me but they liked the fact that i said a bunch of shit or i made them think or whatever it is and i'll talk to them and they were you know they'll they'll tell me here here's what, what here's eight things i don't like about trump Here's what I don't like about his attitude. Here's what I don't like about his business practice. But he was part of the Republican Party, so I got to do it. Like, it's crazy to me. Um, and I think part of that is because, you know, it's like either you go with the Republicans or you have the Tea Party, which I think like any sort of fiscally responsible Republican is not willing <laughs> to go that far over to the right. You know, like, like these Nixon Republicans or these Reagan Republicans can't make that shift over to, to, to that far over to the right 
So it's like, what do they do? They got to vote for whoever the party tells them to vote for. Um, uh, unless there's a, a viable libertarian candidate that, uh, you know, um, I, I, I wasn't a big fan of Gary Johnson. I felt like Gary Johnson had way too many gaps in that election, but yeah, I, you know, if they have like a decent li libertarian candidate, maybe they'll veer away from voting the party. And if that does, that's going to hit the, hit the Republican party, uh, just as, just as hard as, you know, if, if anybody does a writing campaign for Bernie or votes for, um, votes for, for, uh, a, a third party. So yeah, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be an interesting election, I think. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching this clip. If you enjoyed this clip, please make sure that you hit the subscribe button, you hit the like button, make sure that you share this content out. Usually content like this, this anti-establishment comedy content is not uh, shown to as many people uh, as it possibly could be. It does get suppressed quite often, so uh, if you can hit that share button, get the word out there, uh, and tell folks that you enjoyed this video. And if you want to be a part of a live virtual comedy show, the next live virtual comedy show, the next Citizen Revolution comedy show is going to be on May 22nd. Uh, tickets are available for that right now, and then they'll be, um, they'll be happening every Friday uh, at 9 p.m. So tickets are available for these shows at krishmohan.com. That's K-R-I-S-H. M-O-H-A-N dot com. And you got to get your tickets uh, because that's how I'm going to be able to send you the Zoom login information so you can attend the show and we don't get any unwanted visitors in the Zoom show. So like I said, the next one is on May 22nd. Grab your tickets and we'll see you there. Thanks again and we'll see you soon.